Thank you so much. Um, you know, you send in the titles for lectures often before you've written the lecture. So I just want to say that there's a different title for this lecture than is, was listed on posters or whatever. And it won't surprise you, uh, but the title now is Freedom Matters. So. <laughs> In this series of lectures, I, I, I go back and do just a little paragraph on each of the others for some of you who weren't at the other lectures. So, In this series of lectures, I've been pursuing questions of the experience of human free choice, its possibility, and its meaning for us in the whole of our lives. I suggested in the beginning that exploring these questions would, I hoped, shed light on my overall thesis, which is, and has been, every free choice is ultimately a choice of what and how to love. In my first lecture, against the background of perennial theoretical struggles between forms of determinism and convictions about free choice, I focused first on the question of whether freedom of choice can be a realistic expectation of ours or whether it is finally an illusion and the source of self-deception. I explored in a limited way contemporary scientific perspectives on human freedom, finding many reasons against freedom of choice on the part of many scientists, especially because of the nature of the human brain, yet willingness among some scientists to allow its possibility. In my second lecture, I turn to the conscious experience of free choice, an experience acknowledged by scientists, even if and when they deem it illusory, as well as many philosophers and today most theologians. Here my focus was on what free choice is, at least as it is experienced at the level of our conscious awareness. I attempted a descriptive analysis of the experience of free choice in response to the question, what is it that we choose when we choose? Elements identified in objects for choice included a potential action. Here it is. I put it up here ahead of time uh, so that I didn't have to keep going back and forth. Um, elements identified uh, in objects for choice included action, a potential action of one's own, and already actual reasons and motives, that is desires, loves, knowledge, cognitive evaluations. Insofar as this description is helpful or accurate, it offers evidence that indeed every free choice is ultimately a choice of what and how to love. And as the content of an object for choice emerged, along with its status in tension with at least another object for choice, at least two alternatives, uh, two, uh, the, the act of free choice uh, itself became clearer. It's a two-sided act, I said, whereby one whole object is ratified embraced, allowed to issue in action, and competing objects are renounced, let go, or deferred. Insofar as it is a free choice, this act is independent of, not necessitated by, what precedes it, whether external factors or internal, including the already actual affective and cognitive acts within the objects of, of for choice itself. Oh, that's where we are. Having considered the whether question and the what question, my final lecture today focuses on a question of why. That is why it matters that there is human free choice or not. To reflect on this question, I begin with the claim that freedom is for relationship. And I then turn to a theological perspective on human freedom and our relationship with God, as well as with neighbor, self, and all creation. Following this 
and to intensify the question of why free choice matters, I consider our experiences of moral obligation, their place in the object of choice, and how they too open us to freedom in relation. Finally, I pursue the question of what free choice accomplishes. So freedom and relation. Free choice is, I've been saying, an act of self-determination, determining ourselves in action. Yet choice as self-determination is not ultimately centered on self, or need not be. Think again of what is chosen, what is within any potential object for choice, actions to be done, yes, but also and more profoundly, loves, desires, insights, evaluations, perhaps calls, all and each of which have their own objects. So this is what I'm pointing to now. We talk about self-determination, and sometimes people go away and think, well, it's all about how we're doing something for ourselves. But it, it is not that. Yes, we determine ourselves in action by affirming one whole or one other uh, total object for choice. But each one of these, so love, doesn't sit there in the air by itself. It's there on the board, but love has an object. So love somewhat, desire someone, something, uh, knowledge of. So the point is, each of those objects are of, for choice include the objects of the affections and the cognitions that are within them. So all of them have their own objects. Whatever is known and loved, whatever expression or implementation of love is desired because of love. These are held in the object of choice too, and they open us, relate us to what we love and desire in a new way if they're chosen. The object of love may indeed be ourselves, and ought to be sometimes, depending on some particular choices. But the object of love can also be our friends or our enemies, our families or strangers across the world, anything and everything in creation, from the cosmos to the tiniest subatomic particles. And it may be God or whoever or whatever is ultimate for us. The capacity for free choice is a primordial aspect of what it means to be human. It is a basis on which we have a right to respect, to set our own agendas within limits, to determine our own destinies in an important sense. But it is not just about me or need not be. In an example I used in my lecture on Tuesday, the choice to give a gift to a friend is ultimately, or can be, a choice to love the friend, to step into relation in a way that is truer and deeper than ever before, precisely because it is ratified anew, embraced, affirmed again, and in new ways through being chosen again, if it is chosen. Choosing to love my friend is to choose my friend. In the first lecture, I, or at the beginning, I said, well, no, it isn't just choosing a friend. You have to choose an action. Well, that's all there and assumed now. But choose again the one who is loved. But take a more complex example, a choice to forgive someone friend or foe. Like every potential object for choice, this would be in tension with another object for choice, let us say, to refuse to forgive this person. So one of, the, uh, one of them would be, the action would be to forgive, the other would be not to forgive, to refuse forgiveness. The potential action 
in the one object of choice is precisely to forgive or to express forgiveness in a particular way and so forth. The potential action in the alternative object of choice is to refuse to give. Both of these actions are desired for different reasons and in affirmation of different loves or ways of loving. The potential action to forgive is desired, let us say, because reconciliation is desired. And reconciliation is desired, let us say, in order to bring peace to a presently wounded and shattered relationship. Both of these desires rise out of a love for the person who has harmed or injured me. Alternatively, the action to refuse to forgive is desired, for example, because I think this person who harmed me ought first to express some remorse, some repentance for what he has done to me. This desire may arise out of either a need to defend myself from further hurt or a belief that this is the only way to justice for my offender as well as myself. It is possible that if I choose the option to forgive out of love for the one I forgive, it is a fundamental choice to decenter myself, decenter myself, to yield my heart, to let go, to accept the other in and by a healing love. This is what I mean when I say it's all about relation. My self-determination in action is to an other-centered love and action. The opposite might be said to the alternative option, to refuse to forgive. Hence, the two alternatives offer clearly not only different actions, but different desires and loves, or Maybe not so different, since forgiveness is a complex, though utterly important matter. And I could construe the example in a way that in either case, uh, a love, neither, neither of them primarily for myself, could be at the heart of the option that was chosen. I would just have to construe the example differently in detail. My point, however, because I'm not going to uh, spin this out further, my point, however, I hope is clear. That is, freedom is for the sake of relationship, one way or the other, whether with neighbor, myself, all creation, or God. So I turn now to a consideration of free choice and our relationship with God. And I entitled this section, Theology of Freedom, though it's a pretty bare, spare for theology of, of freedom, but uh, I'll give you another tip of an iceberg, maybe. It may seem odd that in a series of lectures like the Taylor Lectures, dedicated to issues in theology, I come to theological questions seemingly very near to the end. In defense of this, I can only say that everything I have been talking about in each lecture could be cast in theological terms or could be interpreted as significant for the theological reflection on free choice. The source of human freedom of choice, its fundamental challenge and opportunity, and its goal are rooted in God and in God's relationship to us and ours to God. What I have articulated in my first two lectures stands or falls on its own persuasiveness. What I say now belongs specifically within a tradition of faith-seeking understanding. I in intend here to speak out of and back into, in particular, 
the Christian community and tradition. Although I acknowledge that there are diverse theologies of freedom in the different strands of Christianity and in the diverse construals of freedom by individual Christian theologians. I have some hope that both a variety of Christian theologians, as well as those who stand in other faith traditions, in particular Judaism and Islam, will recognize similar questions and at least some analogous responses in the diverse strands and the different traditions that are their own. And um, I have a footnote here, which I think uh, I should say, uh, which reads like this. In the interest of transparency, let me say that what follows is more influence, that is my interpretation of a theology of freedom within uh, Christianity, is more influenced by the early writings of St. Augustine than the later, and more by Thomas Aquinas than by William of Ockham, and more by Karl Rahner than Karl Barth, Nonetheless, it is also in some sense deeply influenced by Martin Luther and Martin Buber. And I think it resonates strongly with, though not, it's not derivative from, the work on freedom by my colleagues, David Kelsey and Catherine Tanner, but we shall see. So the first sec subsection under Theology of Freedom is choice of an absolute love. To love with an absolute love is to love someone or something unconditionally and above all else. It is this kind of love that is asked for in the biblical commandment to love God with one's whole heart and soul and mind and strength Given profound beliefs about human utter dependence upon God for our very existence, for every fiber of our being, our life, our capabilities, our actions, our destiny, it's not obvious that a human response to this command and invitation, to, that is to an absolute love of God, can be free. Yet, we are beings who experience a capacity for free choice, who are called to ratify our best loves, to do the deeds of those loves. We have here a paradox, but there are interesting ways to sustain it as such without letting it fall into contradiction. One way, which Thomas Aquinas maintained, long, long ago, but I've hardly heard a better theory. Actually, most theologians today just say, there is no theory that can really resolve this. But in any case, he maintained, well, an infinite God can create beings as God wants them to be, capable of true action of their own that is free. So his solution was utter dependence on God, yet free choice. Why? Because that's what God wanted to create. A similar position was held by Kierkegaard when he argued that the greatest action any being can perform is to help someone else be free. Omnipotence alone made this possible, he said. Contemporary theologies of freedom accepting or assuming this paradox appeals to our understand. Well, I have to say there are loads of theologians through the centuries who resolve any contradiction or paradox by just say, well, they have these two things, divine causality or divine grace on the one hand and human freedom on the other. So you just let go of one of them. Let go of one of them. There are plenty of theologians who've done that in the past. Contemporary theologies of freedom, accepting or assuming this paradox, appeal to our understanding of what it means to be human, understandings based on human experience. 
The chief exponent for many, many years of this theological view has been Karl Rahner. It is his contention that humans must freely decide about themselves, about the meaning of their lives. This is the burden, the challenge, the opportunity of our lives. Because God offers God's own self-communication to us, we are given the possibility of our freedom precisely to accept this self-communication of infinite mystery, which is God. God's gift makes it possible to say yes to God, and in so doing, to say yes to who we are, to share God's affirmation of our destiny by our own receptive affirmation of what God has created and called us to be. Rahner argued that we have various layers of freedom. At the center is the most fundamental area of our freedom, deepest within us. Not just freedom to choose this or that, but freedom, now this is my language, not Rahner's, but freedom to pick up our being and put it down in affirmation of God and of ourselves in absolute love of affective affirmation of God. Our fundamental option, our graced possibility of giving ourselves in utter love, of losing our lives but finding them, enables us to be ourselves in other-centered, whole love of God. We have an alternative to this way of describing an object of choice in relation to God, however. We may say no rather than yes to our own horizon in the heart of God. Or, as David Kelsey puts it, in our capacity for free choice, in taking charge of ourselves, we can choose against the grain of our personal identity and choose to place ourselves in contradiction with God and with our true selves. In Rahner's terms, or Kelsey's, we can choose to repudiate, go against, deny our human identity as ultimately centered in God. Or we can choose to affirm it and find our life, our ultimate open horizon, yet already our home in God. In this will be, according to Rahner, I'm using his language now, in this will be our ultimate salvation or our ultimate destruction. Salvation and destruction are not for honor. External rewards at the end, rewards or punishment, they are what, with God's grace and our freedom, we have become. With absolute love of God, made in some way possible by God's supporting and freeing grace, is the consummation of our freedom and our love in ultimate communion with God. Next subsection. Two freedoms meet. In addition to insights from historical and contemporary theologies of freedom, you know what, I forgot to turn this on, but since I'm standing here, you can hear me anyway, right? <laughs> I suddenly felt, what is this bulging here in my pocket? But if I don't move, I don't really need it, but there we go. Two freedoms meet. In addition to insights from historical and contemporary theologies of freedom, there are the biblical narratives that depict God's promise and God's call, and the possibility of two freedoms meeting, human and divine. Take especially, perhaps, the narrative of the covenant, or covenants, 
and what it tells us about God's freedom and our own. Here is a story of explicit choices, of promises made between God and human persons. Promises to love and, do the, and to do the deeds of love. Promises to be present in love, indeed to abide in it, faithful through changes that unfold in time. The narratives and the prophetic interpretations of the covenant tradition in the Hebrew Bible proclaim God's, uncon God's unconditional commitment to a people. By the way, I, I have done a, a much fuller study of all the many possible interpretations of the covenant tradition. I'm only using one of them today. But if you, if you wanted to look what how I did that, that in the context of commitment and choice. Uh, my earlier book, Personal Commitments, the final chapter is totally on some of these things anyway. The narratives and prophetic interpretations of the covenant tradition in the Hebrew Bible proclaim God's unconditional commitment to a people. And these narratives and interpretations gradually clarify the nature of that people's struggle to understand and to sustain an absolute commitment to God. An important question for our purposes here is, however, does it make any difference at all to God what human persons do in response to God's promise? In one sense, it may make no difference. God's love is committed out of infinite freedom to the people of Israel in countless ways and times, no matter what. And this same commitment, Christians believe, is continued and sealed in and by the life and death of Jesus. Once a commitment, a choice is made and lived unto death, there can be no turning back. Whatever the response of human persons, then, God's love and promise remain. But in another sense, what human persons do in response to God's promise makes all the difference in the world. In fact, God seems in this story, this narrative, as we read it again and again, to have got, God seems to have gone to great lengths to insist that this does make a difference, the response of the people, both to the world and to God. But what sort of difference could it make? The response of human persons, our response through time and change, makes a difference only if the goal of the covenant and of God's love is a relationship that is mutual. And if mutuality between God and human persons depends on the free response of human persons. Just as it is possible for any one human person to choose unilaterally and unconditionally to love another, but not possible for that person unilaterally to choose friendship with the other, since friendship requires a responding choice of mutual love. So, you understand what I'm saying? I can choose to love you, uh, whether you like it or not, or whether you even know about it or not. But I can't choose friendship with you unless you come out from your freedom. So, it is possible for God to commit God's own love unconditionally, but not to effect friendship, mutuality, with human persons without their free response. The goal of the covenant, indeed the goal of creation, of reconciliation, of our destiny to communion, appears indeed to include relationship that is 
mutual. Two liberties, two freedoms can and must therefore meet. The offer is the offer of communion, of knowing and being known, loving and being loved. This is the offer of a God whose glory is manifest in shared history, shared labor, but also in shared intimacy with the people God creates. In the biblical narrative, God's desire for free response seems to be an anguished yearning as often as it is a command. The only response that will suffice is for human persons, ourselves, to love God with an absolute love, with, that is, our whole heart and soul and mind and strength. And for us to choose this in so far as we are able in the fullest depth of our freedom. If the call and command to love God is to an absolute love, unconditional and above all, it is paired, as we know, with the command and the call to love our neighbor as ourself. This, like our command and our call to love God, is unconditional. It's a call to unconditional love of our neighbor. Since human persons are the kind of being whose intrinsic worth is unconditional, they, we, are ends in ourselves and deserve to be loved as such, not as mere means for the ends of others. But unlike the love asked of us for God, our love for one another, for all human persons, is unconditional but relative, not absolute. Relative here, however, does not mean, oh, it's relativized, uh, it's not really that important, or maybe it's ultimately conditional, not unconditional, or something we can take or leave. Love of our neighbor is to be relative to our love for God precisely because our very being and the beings of those we love are related to God. That's what it means to be a human person, to be related to God. There need be no t competition between the loves demanded of us for God and for one another. It is rather like Martin Buber's view of stepping into relation, saying thou to God and to other persons and things. We cannot, he maintains, say thou to more than one created being at a time in a given moment, but we can say thou to a created being and simultaneously say thou to the eternal thou, who is God. So too, because of the relatedness of our neighbor to God, God in whom we live and move and have our being, all of us, and to whom we desire to relate in absolute love as the center of all, it is the case that to encounter, to say thou to, to love our neighbor, is to encounter, say thou to, and love the eternal thou, because the eternal thou is to be met in every, in every created thou. To do so in freedom is to open ourselves and become ourselves, determining ourselves as centered both within ourselves and beyond ourselves in those we love. I move now to a consideration of moral obligation. A little bit change of pace, but I do so in order to continue to show how free choice, self-determination, is for the sake of relation. So this section is entitled The Experience of Moral Obligation. 
To reflect on our experiences of moral obligations helps us to understand its place within the object of choice. Now I have it here, shorthand. We make other kinds of judgments, assessing our loves, our desires, our actions. We also make judgments of ought, of obligation. It's a different kind of judgment, which I'm going to try to describe in a moment, or a different kind of experience, first of all. And some people claim that every choice is a moral choice. I, I don't know whether that's the case. It all depends on how wide your category is going to be. But if it is a moral choice, it's going to have within its object an additional element, which is an experience of moral obligation. So to reflect on our experiences of moral obligation helps us to understand its place within the object of choice, and hence its place in our choosing. At the heart of an experience of moral obligation is a judgment of a different kind than the evaluative ones we have already talked about. This is an insight and a judgment that we ought to do something. To try to understand this, we can turn to the experience of others as well as our own. We have dramatic and classic examples in the narrative histories of some individuals' lives, such as Martin Luther's, Here I Stand, or Nelson Mandela's visibly persistent struggle against the horrors of apartheid or the story of Joan of Arc's, I will not deny the voices I have heard. We have other examples in the lives of persons we know, parents caring for children, children caring for elderly parents, friends dedicating their lives to the demands of solidarity with the economically deprived, writers evincing intellectual honesty even at a cost to their professional careers, Almost everyone can recall experiences of their own, dramatic or mundane, of a clear moral obligation that cannot be denied, even though it can be refused. Not everyone, of course, experiences moral obligation in exactly the same way. A particular experience is shaped by a particular claim by what generates it, and by the level of capacity in the individual to recognize it. We may experience it, for example, in a command of God, or through a whole way of believing and living shaped by the following of Jesus Christ, or in an encounter with persons who are unjustly oppressed and in grave need, or in the new claims of an unfolding great love or through insight into the sheer logic of a moral principle, of a moral principle that grasps our assent in a concrete context. All of these experiences open us to relationship, even though we frequently think they are for us constraints on our freedom. There are, I'm going to suggest, five elements in any experience insofar as it can be called an experience of moral obligation. So first of all, I can put these up here just in one word. First of all, it's an experience of a claim. Experience of a claim made upon us, a demand made of us a summons given to us. But secondly, the claim itself is experienced as addressed to our freedom. This is why it gets into an object for choice. Experienced, a claim experienced as addressed to our freedom, to our free choice, we can respond or not. 
Third, as a moral claim, it is experienced as unconditional. Unconditional. <clears throat> it is not a matter of, if I want to avoid punishment, I ought to do X. Or even, if I want to get to heaven, I ought to do X. But simply, though with reasons, I ought to do X. In addition, fourth element, the claim must at least appear to be justifiable. Might be wrong, but it has to at least appear to be justifiable or it, is, it ceases to be a claim. If upon reflection or the gaining of more information, for example, I conclude that the claim I experienced is not able to be justified, that it is a false claim or unfair or a matter of my runaway superego or a claim that is relativized because it's overridden by a competing claim, then it ceases to be experienced as a moral claim. For example, I may experience a moral obligation to participate in what I judge to be a just war. Yet, as I actually take part in this war or support it in some way, I discern or discover that it has no moral legitimacy. In this case, my experience of moral obligation evaporates. It's gone because the claim is not justifiable. Or perhaps it modulates into an experience of obligation not to abandon my comrades, or it changes into a perceived claim to oppose the war. Finally, a moral claim is experienced as both an obligating demand and a liberating appeal. Now, this is my description of the experience. Once again, like the, before, you have experiences that you think are experiences of moral obligation. They don't have that element. So I'd be happy to hear about it, or additional elements. Now, the, the last one, that it's an experience of a claim that is both an obligating demand and a, a liberating appeal. Uh, I need to say something more about that. This is why it, this is why as it addresses our free choice, it opens us to relation and offers both self-determination and self-transcendence. It is not just a felt requirement to sustain oneself as innocent. It is a liberating appeal because even when response to it appears extremely difficult, it is nonetheless experienced not as an alien imposition, but as a way of being true to myself. It rings true to myself. It does not, in other words, do violence to me. It awakens my freedom, concentrates my moral discernment regarding something to be loved, desired, acted upon. Yet it is not simply a desire of mine, I want to do it, although it may be in accord with at least some of my desires. Rather, in addition to being an appeal it appears larger than myself or my own desires. It demands something of me. It is a form of command to me and perhaps even a call. Now my last section, what does freedom accomplish? There have been philosophers who on the one hand exalt the possibilities of human free choice but who also despair of it because unconstrained freedom appears to undo everything in a life, always reversing who one really is. 
never establishing anything that can accrue into a unified self. I'm speaking in particular like uh, you know, the great um, advocate of freedom, Jean-Paul Sartre, in the middle of the 20th century. He thought we had almost total freedom. But what was so despairing about it was if you, in any instant, you could reverse what you had chosen before. Freedom included that. So you ended up with nothing. Or you start over again. But then that too. This is why we talked a lot about absurdity. Karl Rahner was writing about free choice in that same era. And I think, though I've not seen in his text a de de uh, an explicit response to Sartre, uh, I think uh, he was responding to that sort of thing in some of the things he said, and that which I'll say now. Against this interpretation, that you could never make yourself be, so choice is self-determining, but then poof, away it goes, because you make another choice. And of course, there was no context of God or value already there that would hold you to it. Against this interpretation of freedom, Rahner insisted that freedom, especially freedom before God, is not, as I said a few moments ago, not simply the capacity to choose this or that. It is the capacity for creative self-formation, growing self-disposal of love, accomplishing something definite as a person in relation to God, one's neighbor, and all creation. By choosing to say yes to who we are, within our yes to God, we can affirm our loves, expand them, and make them more true, more just, more integrated in relation to an absolute love of God. Freedom, of course, is limited constrained in important ways. Our capacity for freedom of choice varies. Our options for free choice are more or less limited. Our choices themselves are not always shaped by very good moral discernment or disciplined loves. We need strength from one another, as well as the hidden movements of God's grace in order to become practiced wise, courageous, on our various journeys to our shared goals. Our hearts need continual conversion if our loves are to be just. Our embodied selves require active engagement if we are to make a more just world. Growth in freedom has nothing to do with our actions becoming automatic, our choices listless, our responsibilities lessened. Lots of times people say, well, the, more, the better you get at making choices or making the right choices, well, you don't have to think about it anymore. So that's true. I think that's probably true for Tom Brady throwing the football that I talked about on Tuesday. But it's not true for growth in uh, capacity for free choice. It does, growth in freedom does have to do with moral development that makes some actions more and more unthinkable and some more and more desirable in the service of our loves. Alternatives become theoretical, not real. I could never do that. So it looks like, well, I don't have any choices to build. If I become a saint, uh, I could never do any of these things, so no, I don't have any choices to make. I said, I think it was the first lecture, maybe, or maybe it was, maybe it was last Tuesday, that um, you always have to have alternatives to have choice. And I said, in my final lecture, I would qualify that. Here's where I qualify it. I think myself that we do grow so that some things that were options are no longer options for us. They're not in play for us anymore. Does that mean if I grow in love for you, or love for God, or love for my neighbor near and far, that there's nothing more to do, we're just 
I just love you now. All the, all the choices have been made. It can't mean that. Because there's always the more. Always the more. So to be able to pick up one's being and place it in affirmation of God or of one another, there's always the more. And it takes a choice. We are not yet whole in our freedom, but we have the task, supported by grace, of trying to become so. And we have the opportunity of picking up our being, such as it is, and placing it down in affirmation of unconditional, absolute love for God and related, unconditional loves for one another. Thank you. this because we have a reception in five minutes, but I thought there'd be five minutes for questions maybe yeah. or so. <laughs> we have at least five ten minutes for questions, and uh, I'll ask Margaret to repeat the question because we seem to be having technical difficulties with the mic, and so in order to get a um, recording of this, uh, Margaret will repeat your question so that we picked up on her uh, lapel mic. Okay. Hmm. The last two times there were loads of questions. Tom. Yeah, how would be uh, one, of, one, of, one of the couple of things that immediately come to mind, and that is context. Yes. That is, when I feel these claims and I grapple with my freedom and their unconditional force, their justifiable and so on, then it, I'm always in a concrete context. Yes. And so that plays a role, that places constraints on what I can do. Absolutely, and it places it. It um, it generates the claim. Uh, sometimes people generate claims for us uh, without paying attention to the context, and they're not justifiable, or they're not unconditional, or so on. Yes. Well, thank you. Yes, Jennifer. Yes. Because of the way that you frame all the judgments as internal to X option or Y option. So I'm wondering if one can also have judgments that this love is more weighty than that love. But you have your options, but you have judgments that in a sense stand outside those two conflicts that you have. Well, uh, I think the reason I put them inside, remember I also said uh, last Tuesday, that to make judgments, you have to have norms or criteria. And by one criteria, you judge this the preferable option. By another criterion, you judge this to be the preferable option. And it can be this love takes priority. This love takes priority because of such and such. So compare, compare on that criteria, it should be chosen, ought to be chosen, and this is within it. But on another criterion, this love looks preferable. I get more out of it, or whatever. And on that criteria, this one is preferable to that. So the choice is to, to determine which preference, which norm, which claim, which judgment, I'm going to ratify, and which I'm going to let go. And will there be reasons for that? Reasons. The, that's why I have, a, I mean, the, the, the diagram, as I put it here, is totally in that. You know, I put knowledge up there. I put judge. That's all reasoning, deliberation, discernment. All of that has to be within this. But not a, not a reason for ratifying A over B. Yes, a re, the, what I just said about the criterion. If you have a criterion for preferring this, to this, from one point of view. Remember, I gave the example about the woman who had two job office offers. Uh, on one criteria, which is importance of salary, 
this was preferable to this. On another criterion, which was work that I liked to do, this took preference over that. Um, now, I can't even say that without assuming that I know something about who the object, who, who I'm, what the relationship is, why the desire for that action, etc. Uh, those are the reasons. I lumped them all together. I, 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 I said I, last time I was changing my language from, from love, desire, uh, knowledge, judgment, and so on, because it might help to understand what I was saying about those, to use simply the terms motives and reasons. So motives, and, and by the way, sometimes, sometimes those get collapsed, but motives are affective at least. Reasons may not be. But either way, we have reasons for this, motives for this, reasons for this, motives for this. Ways in which they are brought in tension. It's not just any old objects for choice, parallel. But they're in tension with one another. I have to, if I'm going to have one or the other, I have to choose it. I have to ratify one and let the other go. Because right now, they're in tension and neither one will move into action if I don't resolve that tension. So, so I have a big stake in putting these judgments inside. I mean, there are all kinds of other judgments that can be being made as well. But the choice itself includes a choice of judgment. Which judgment am I going to act on? And I think that becomes uh, perhaps most clear when it's a question of a moral choice. That you have in one an, a moral obligation. Actually, uh, this probably not, never happens exactly this way because if, if when you're making a choice, you, uh, only one of them will be of a moral obligation because only one of them can be unconditional. I mean, you could look at things different ways and say, well, I'll, this, they're competing, both of them are moral matters, uh, but I don't experience a moral obligation unless one or the other of them have, uh, are unconditional and justifiable and so on. Now, of course, I'm tipping my hand on one thing. I don't think there are true moral dilemmas. There are multiple competing experiences of moral obligation, but the challenge is to resolve them. Yeah. And so I hear you saying these are incommensurable, then my worry would be that the choices are arbitrary. What are in incommensurable? <laughs> Well, they're not incommensurable. Again, take that simple example of the woman. It's not incommensurable, her two possibilities for a job. They can be compared, but they're compared. It doesn't make them incommensurable that they're compared on she needs a big salary and she likes different kind of work. They're, you can compare them. That's what she has to do. That's what decision making is, it seems to me. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, in drawing on Rahner and the notion that this fundamental choice is the choice for God and our very being in relation for God, mm -hmm. um, like it seems to conflate like God and our well-being and the others that we're supposed to be loving also. And so I was wondering like where what's going wrong when we can wrongly like choose idols, choose to operate with according to, say, a relationship with a friend or a mentor is sort of like our defining mode rather than the relationship to God, where those might be actually in tension. So what do we, what do, we do with well, that culture, basically? Well, there are a number of questions within your question. Uh, I mean, I've said, in principle, love of a human person does not need to compete with love for God. You can love God and, in a person and a person in God. On the other hand, I think what you're referring to is there are uh, situations in which, uh, in which they are opposed to one another, or at least compete with one another. Um, 
because, well, let's say uh, I work too long in sexual ethics. I can't <laughs> examples, but suppose <laughs> I would start thinking of other examples. But um, suppose you mentioned a tutor or a mentor or whatever. So I uh, I'm married, and uh, and I I don't want to be unmarried. And, and I do love God, and, and here's another road I can go down. Go down that road, another love, which is going to compete with my, the love within my marriage. And if I interpret it this way, uh, it's going to compete with my love for God because it violates uh, what I perceive God to ask of me to do and to be. My clear, now, in that case, they really do come into tension. I really want to do this. On the other hand, here's my wife. Or I really want to do this. On the other hand, uh, this will involve me in some way in something that I perceive at least to be uh, a denial of my relationship with God. Or, I mean, most often it is, I got a better idea than absolute love for God. And so I avert my eyes and uh, don't think about it. I don't make a radical choice. Or maybe all the while I am doing so, but uh, I don't uh, face up to it myself. So there are all kinds of possibilities. So I don't want to narrow what I was saying about absolute unconditional love for God in a way that no matter what I do, I, of course I have absolute unconditional love for God. I, I don't want to be saying that. There are contradictions in our lives. Yes? Professor Farley, I have a question about your fourth criterion. Yes. Um, for a moral obligation, or the experience of a moral obligation. Yeah, the justifiability of the yeah, claim. I, I, I wasn't sure if if you were saying justifiable or indefeasible. Because it say, say that again, justifiable, justifiable or... or indefeasible. Uh -huh. Because it seems to me on the one hand, I can justify, I have reasons that are justifying reasons for different courses of action. Take, for example, uh, an act of religiously motivated violence. I, I can have different justifying reasons right, sure. for that. But you, 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 it seemed to me that you were saying that if I had any competing justified reason, I never, I didn't meet the fourth criteria. Is that what you meant? Well, what I was trying to say was if I had no justifying reason, mm -hmm. then I would not experience a moral claim. Because it seems like, I, when you were talking to Professor Hurt, it seemed like, you, well, you said that objectively there really aren't any moral claims. Yes, but that, I mean, that's, that's a tricky statement to make, so I, I, I only just have it sit there. What I mean is that we often talk about, especially in medical ethics and contexts like that, uh, here's a moral dilemma, because on the one hand, I ought to do this, on the other hand, I ought to do that. When I say I don't think there are any really final moral dilemmas, I don't mean there aren't some in people's experience. I, what I mean is, that somehow there is a way to discern the priority of these two claims. But that doesn't open up. But the that's idea. in theory. Okay. So I was yeah. that would open up the idea of an incommensurability problem. If subjectively I can have just if I can justify this claim and it seems to me have more obligation, and I can justify this other claim that feels to have more obligation, it seems to me that I can have. No, but you still have to ask about which takes priority. We always have competing moral obligations, mm -hmm. but which takes priority? And in choice, yeah. uh, the which based by priority is often the question of which moral norm am I going to give priority to, or which aspects of a given context am I going to uh, take account of, etc. What kind of moral reasoning will I engage in about this? Thank you. I have one more question. There's a hand back there. 
question for an observation. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, I've been thinking about this since Tuesday. And the fact that love is sort of really the, the central focus here. I'm wondering about people who, where there's a break there, and where love is broken, either through uh, violence or through, uh, say, uh, loss of a spouse after six years of marriage, where people seem to be paralyzed in decision making. Well, uh, again, yes and no. Um, the kind of uh, examples that you suggested, uh, we're probably not very good at making choices until we heal in some way or another, or, or grieve, or what have you. That, that's certainly true in our experience. On the other hand, uh, most of our choices aren't easy, <laughs> aren't simple, aren't uh, uh, sliding down uh, the hill. Uh, they're, they're because we are troubled. I mean, love, I had this in one of my uh, lectures and I had to take it out, there wasn't time, but uh, there are some philosophers now who, who've sort of given up the notion of figuring out anything more about free choice. So, so they now want to talk about love. And love is the solution to everything. Uh, and my own conviction is love is not the solution. Love is the problem. That's why I started in the first lecture. And I don't mean problem, uh, 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 intractable, etc. cetera. I, I mean, it's the glory of our lives. But that's why I started by saying I was inspired by uh, St. Augustine, who said, you don't have to tell anybody to love. Everybody loves someone or something. The real question is what and how we love. And that comes into the deepest of our uh, options for choice, it seems to me. Well, that point, we'll have to call this moment.